Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out on what uh, could have been a very, very rainy night. I think we got a little lucky with the weather. Uh, I certainly appreciate it. I know it's difficult to get out on a weeknight. Um, but I think these are really important issues because um, one of the most, <clears throat> we're going to see this as I go through the program tonight, one of the most difficult transitions for any kid uh, is going from K-12 to to post-secondary. And for kids with ADHD, executive functioning impairment, kids with learning disabilities, it's a particularly difficult <coughs> transition to make, probably the most difficult they'll ever make. And so I think that it's important that we take a look at some of the challenges that they're gonna face as they face this difficult transition, which is compounded by a number of significant changes in the law that impact them and actually magnify a lot of the problems that they have. We're gonna talk a little bit about stigma tonight uh, and how that impairs a lot of these kids from getting services when they go on to college. Uh, and I had a couple of people approach me before the beginning of the program to ask, you know, if my son or daughter doesn't have ADHD, is this still going to apply? And the answer is absolutely. I talk in terms of ADHD because I've got 52 years of experience with it myself but also as a hub, because there's an old expression that, that ADHD rarely walks alone. That in 65 to 70% of cases, uh, it appears with a co-occurring disorder or a learning disability. And when one or more things kind of appear together, what typically happens is they each magnify each other. And so, uh, but all of the legal uh, issues that I'm going to address tonight are going to apply to not only all kids with uh, special ed issues or special needs, but also any child. I mean, parents of any student that is transitioning from high school to college, you need to be aware of some of these legal issues, and that's what we're going to go into, okay? So let's get started. Um, students with ADHD and learning disabilities are extremely bright students, okay? They have talents and very high potential, however, they're also at high risk. The reason they're at high risk is that they are three times more likely to be held back uh, in school than compared to students without ADHD or learning disability. They're twice as likely to drop out of high school than those without ADHD or learning disability. They are seven times less likely to graduate college in four years compared to their non-ADHD or LD counterparts. And three times more likely to get suspended uh, part of what I do, I was just explaining to someone, is in addition to uh, special ed planning, IEP work, uh, and all of that stuff, my particular field of expertise is in the area of school discipline and criminal prosecution, which is happening all too often at the same time now. More and more schools are referring students with discipline issues to the police and uh, it makes the situation much, much more dangerous and the stakes are much higher. So, let's continue. This is essentially what we're gonna cover tonight. We're gonna talk about the nature of ADHD and various learning disabilities and their relationships to processing information as well as to each other. And how when many of these appear at the same time, how it exacerbates the situation. We're going to talk about the impact of ADHD and learning disabilities on transition, various points of transition that these kids are going to face as they go through the school system, K-12, to until that final uh, change from uh, K-12 to through to, um, to post-secondary, okay? Um, we're going to talk about the social impact of these disorders and executive functioning impairment on this transition and also the legal implications, because the laws that govern students with special needs radically change when they graduate from K-12 to and go on to post-secondary. Everything changes, and you really need to know what you're facing here before you get there. Um, again, I want to premise this. When you go to law school, they, they teach you very often. I say this when I talk about uh, ADHD and neurological stuff. Uh, I give a good disclaimer up front, okay, if I talk about medical stuff. But also, I don't have a magic wand, okay? So nothing I say tonight is going to make all of your problems go away. But what it can do is it can be the difference between 
walking through a minefield with a map in your hands mm -hmm. versus being chased through one blindfolded. Nobody wants that, and it's a huge difference. And so by addressing some of these issues and maybe talking about some strategies that you can use to proactively address this transition, you're in a better situation, okay? Um, and then finally, we're going to get to those strategies to talk about uh, addressing those, uh, those transition problems. All right, let's talk about ADHD first, okay? What is ADHD? ADHD is a neurobiological disorder affecting, affecting the prefrontal cortex of the brain. That is the portion of the brain, and again, I'm sure I am grossly oversimplifying this, okay, uh, that regulates executive functioning, okay? <clears throat> It also represents a uh, dysfunction in the neurotransmitter system, and I'm going to give you some visuals to explain what that kind of seems like, and specifically three neurotransmitters, specifically dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. Dopamine, for those of you who don't know, is essentially the pleasure center of the brain, okay? Uh, that is what, what uh, opiates typically will interact with. Um, also, norepinephrine is essentially adrenaline. And so you will see a lot of students with ADHD gravitating towards high stimulation activity, gambling, alcohol, substance use, uh, sexual experimentation, that type of thing. These are the base jumpers, the motocross riders, people who are not getting enough norepinephrine flowing through their nervous system and seek for outside ways to kind of compensate for that, whether they know it or it's completely uh, unconscious, all right? Now, executive functioning. Let's talk about executive functioning. A lot of people will say it's like the office manager in your brain. Um, I like to think of it as the symphony conductor, okay? Issues are organization, prioritization, Time perception, and that is a huge one, okay? Most people will say, if you have ADHD, you can't manage your time, okay? That is a gross understatement. If you have ADHD, you can't manage anything, okay? That's a given. Time is a particularly difficult problem because it's a matter of time perception. It's a matter of a huge disconnect. Think about this for a second. If your mind, this, this, we think of hyperactivity as the kid who's bouncing off the walls, and that's what you can see objectively. But there's also a significant amount of cognitive hyperactivity. Um, I was being interviewed uh, for an article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine uh, a number of years ago, and I was trying to explain this to the reporter that was interviewing me, and we were sitting in my office, everyone had gone home, it was relatively quiet, and she said, I, I don't get it, you seem like a pretty normal person. And I don't know what she was expecting, but <laughs> what I was trying to explain to her was, we're having a normal conversation, but what you don't see is that there's an amusement park going on behind my eyes right now, okay? And that is kind of the same thing. If things are moving around at the speed of light inside of your head, there's a huge disconnect between that and the physical reality of life, okay? And so there's a, a, a unique distortion there uh, in terms of time. And another problem that we have is, statistically speaking, the drug of choice for adolescents with ADHD or executive functioning impairment, often because of the uh, amount of anxiety that's involved, is marijuana, which further distorts time perception, uh, which makes things much worse, okay? Um, it's about not being able to accurately estimate how long a, a task is going to take, about always thinking you have more time than you actually do to do something, okay? That's one of the things that I am incredibly challenged with. I say this all of the time, and I apologize to those of you who've heard me speak before, but I have ADHD. My wife suffers from ADHD because she married me, okay? That's kind of, she is along for the ride, unfortunately. And it does have a significant person, your child with ADHD or executive functioning impairment, but also those around them. Um, so, impulse control, which I refer to often as the behavioral culprit. 
These kids know the difference between right and wrong, but it's an inability to regulate their own behavior. It's an inability to suppress the impulse to do what seems like a good idea right now, even if they know that there will likely be consequences. Self-regulation, a huge problem. The inability to regulate your own behavior, okay? Attention regulation, that's important. Just like time, you will often hear people think of ADHD as a disorder where you can't pay attention, okay? It's not that easy. In fact, that's even misleading because parents will come to me and say, how could you tell me that my son can't pay attention when he can play video games for 10 hours, okay? It's not an inability to pay attention. It's an inability to regulate attention. There is either no attention or extreme hyper-focus. There's no middle of the road. When you're telling that kid to turn off the video game and they're not listening, it's not because they want to be uncooperative. You don't exist in their world at that moment, okay? You have to understand it that way, okay? There is, it's almost like a vortex that you get sucked into. Uh, and, and in many ways, if you have difficulty at things with things that you find that are boring, uh, classwork, sitting and listening to the algebra lecture or whatever it is, when you find things that you're either good at or that you like or that uh, drive those neurotransmitters that we were talking about, you will kind of almost force yourself to climb into something because that's what the quote unquote normal people do, okay? They sit down with a book and they can actually read it, okay? So, um, Short-term memory is a big problem, which is essentially um, attention. Uh, it's a function of attention. You have to think about a brain as if it were a computer, okay? In any given computer, there are two types of memory, okay? There is how much com uh, information your computer can store, long-term memory, how many gigabytes or whatever it is, okay? And people with ADHD often have Excellent, frightening, long distance recall, okay? But going back to the computer analogy, there also is something on your computer called random access memory. And that is essentially how many programs can operate at the same time, the RAM in the computer. That is short term memory. And that is where there is a significant problem, okay? <laughs> Just to give you an example, I was tested a number of years ago and uh, I got essentially two, that I remember, functional IQ scores. The one that, the two that I remember mostly are verbal comprehension, I scored 137, which I was told was very high functioning. My working memory was 89, okay? I was told that if there's a 15 point discrepancy between those two scores, that's considered clinically significant. I had a 40 point spread, okay? I came home that night and my wife was like, did you learn anything about yourself from the testing? And, and I'm like thinking about it and I'm like, you know, I think I'm like the rain man, you know? I mean, I'm like this high functioning savant in, in a way, you know? So, now, the other part of neurotransmitters, okay? This is significant. When we were all in middle school, we learned that when you put your hand on the hot stove that a signal goes up your arm to your brain that says, it's hot, move your hand, okay? And we think about that the same way you would think of plugging in an electric light into a socket. The electricity goes up the wire and the light goes on, okay? But it's not like that in the human body. There is not one long continuous wire. The human nervous system is made up of a series of short disconnected wires, okay? And those disconnections are bridged by those neurotransmitters and the receptors that receive them very specifically. And if there is a problem with either production or the flow of those neurotransmitters, there's a break in the system, okay? It's a neurologic disorder. Now, learning disabilities. What are learning disabilities? And there are many of them. Okay? Essentially, the best definition I could come up with from my research was 
neurologically based processing problems or challenges, okay, that can interfere with basic learning skills and processing of information. And there are various examples I have here of learning disabilities. You've all heard of dyslexia. People often think of dyslexia as kids who will transpose letters or words, but dyslexia actually is a much broader category of a learning disability that can encompass many things uh, in terms of interpreting or decoding words. Um, dysgraphia, handwriting problems. I probably have uh, undiagnosed dysgraphia as well as sensory integration disorder. Uh, I have a number of sensory integration problems. I sleep with a weighted pillow on my chest. Uh, my wife laughs at me because when I walk down the street, if one of my shoes becomes untied, I will tie it, and then I will untie the other shoe and retie that one because they have to be equally tight for me. <laughs> we, we see that a lot of these kids, it's usually a very big disconnect between where the rest of the universe ends and their bodies begin. So they either are hypersensitive that they don't want things on their extremities, or they need things on their extremities to make that distinction. Okay, uh, dyspraxia uh, is, uh, reflects their uh, motor skills problems. A lot of kids that fall down a lot have difficulty moving through their day without getting injured. Phonemic awareness is a, your ability to actually equate phonetic sounds with written words. And students can have a learning disability with phonemic awareness, which in many cases can appear like attention deficit disorder when it's not. For instance, if a kid is having a phonemic awareness problem and they can't connect those phonetic sounds with the printed words, while the class is reading, they will typically shut down and disconnect. And that can often outwardly appear like attention deficit disorder when it is in fact not. Okay? Which is why it's really important that you, when you take your child to an evaluator, they are someone that can look into everything that might be going on. Dyscalculia involves uh, math issues. Okay? Now, learning disabilities can interfere with specific processes and also higher level skills like, guess what, our old friend executive functioning, okay? Which is really significant because that is the one crucial skill that they're gonna need when you send them off to college, okay? When you send them outside of the structure that you've built in their house, the structure that they get in high school every single day, okay? The things that they rebel against, are probably their best friends in some ways. And when these kids go off to college, it's kind of like we cut them loose in space. And if they have executive functioning and parenting, a big problem. I also want to mention really quickly the difference. Executive functioning has become somewhat of a buzzword. Okay, uh, Executive functioning um, refers to the specific issues I was talking about earlier. Uh, prioritization, management, time perception, a bunch of those symptoms. You can have an executive functioning impairment that might not be to the level of diagnosable ADHD. So if you have an executive functioning impairment, you don't necessarily have ADHD. However, if you've got ADHD, you have an executive functioning impairment, okay? You think of it that way. Um, and the skills or symptoms we're talking about are the same. Organization, time, planning, abstract reasoning, long or short-term memory problems, uh, and uh, our old friend attention. Okay, ADHD and LD, I said before, ADHD rarely walks alone. In 65 to 70% of cases, ADHD appears with a co-occurring condition or a learning disability. Um, Co-occurrence can often magnify the symptoms of each of those different components and also um, make things worse in terms of the social and legal changes that they're going to be facing when they transition to college. Okay, And it's important that you understand something. Learning disabilities, ADHD, are performance deficits. They are not intelligence deficits, okay? Every single student I've ever represented in my practice are enormously talented, bright, and intelligent kids. They learn differently. They process information differently. It's important that you see that. 
okay? And I know as parents or educators, sometimes it's frustrating. You know, you find yourself saying, as much as I love my son or daughter, why can't you just do what you're supposed to do? Um, but what you don't know is that learning disabilities and ADHD permeate their sense of self-esteem to such a large degree. And what you don't see is the self-torture that goes on and the uh, frustration that they have at not being understood, okay? Now, all right, executive functioning impairments, these are different transitional points that are significant for kids with ADHD and learning disabilities. And for many kids, uh, it's not limited to those groups. Third to fourth grade. Third to fourth grade transition is a huge one, okay? And why is that? Before third grade or fourth grade, depending on the curriculum, kids are evaluated based upon how generally intelligent they are and how well they get along with the other kids in the classroom, okay? When they get to third or fourth grade, all of these administrative tasks and life skills start to kind of bleed into their lives. And those are the things that actually impact their executive functioning deficits. That's the big problem. Uh, elementary school, obviously, I believe the most significant is high school to college, and I'll explain why as we move through this, and college into the workforce, okay? Now, I hear this time and time again, and when I represent kids, I ask their parents to leave the room, and I talk to them. And if you're going to take home one thing from tonight's presentation, parents, it's talk to your kids. Let them drive this process. They should. Teach them how to articulate their disability and advocate for themselves, because the law is going to require that they do that when they move on to college. The earlier you can start that process in the home, the better off you both are, okay? Most of these kids, when they get to these transitional points, will say the same thing or something like it. It's not that the work is harder this year, but there's so many more things I have to remember this year, okay? And what do they have to remember when they get to, say, fourth grade, <clears throat> okay? In addition to the actual understanding of the work, which can be difficult if you have a learning disability that involves mathematics or handwriting or whatever, um, now they have to organize their papers. As a kid, I never, ever, ever did homework, okay? It's astounding to me at how many of my clients do the homework and never hand it in. It's in the bottom of the locker or shoved in the bottom of a desk. And I don't care how smart you are. You don't get credit for work you don't hand in, okay? They have to remember to bring their lunch. They have to remember to bring their lunch money. Now they have different books. And navigating the school building and remembering which book to bring with them at any given time during the day or to take home with them at night. They have to remember to take the book home so they can do the homework so that they can hand it in and get credit for it, okay? They have different notebooks or binders that they have to keep track of. These are all executive functioning organizational life skills that they trip over themselves, okay? It's not because they're not intelligent. It's not because they don't understand the science project. A lot of these kids are, you got three minutes to get from this room to the other side of the campus, and you better have the right book with you. They have to have a pen. I mean, something basic that you would take for granted. I never had a pen in my hand going to school as a kid. I was always looking to borrow one from somebody, never planning, okay? And also, as they get older, their assignments are longer-term assignments. They have book reports that are due uh, in a couple of weeks. And remember that time perception problem we talked about? All right. Again, I apologize to those of you who have heard this before, but I want you to think, visualize it this way. New York City is the center of commerce and culture and finance and everything in, in the world. People come from all over the world to get to this metropolis. But think for a second, instead of several international airports, let's say there was only one poorly run landing strip, okay? That's the desktop, the RAM in there. These planes are coming in from all over the world, but they've got no place to land. 
So what do they do? In an airport situation, they stack them up in holding patterns. And so all of these thoughts are whizzing around up there, okay? But if one of those planes had a bomb on it, instant clearance to land. Why? Because it's an emergency. And people with ADHD and many learning disabilities will often gravitate towards crisis situations, and many of us will even manufacture crisis situations because it's a means of forced prioritization, okay? You got six weeks to do that, that book report, but it's the Sunday night before it's due when you're under the covers with the flashlight, okay, because it's an emergency. It's do or die right now, okay, and we need that. Many of us go through our lives lighting and putting out fires from place to place to place because it's the only way we can move forward. It's a coping mechanism. It's a scary coping mechanism because there's a lot of high risk there, okay? It can impact those around us, okay? And as you get older and go through these transitions, the stakes get much higher as you get into business and you represent clients, etc. Okay, transition from high school to college. It's difficult for any kid, okay? Um, there's a complete lack of structure and accountability compared to what they're used to in high school, okay? I say this a lot because I talk about school discipline and uh, criminal prosecution uh, in many times when I speak, but high school, middle school also, is probably the closest thing in real life that you'll ever come to uh, that's like a prison, okay? The bell rings, you gotta go from here to there. Every part of your day is completely regimented, okay? They, they get, every day they get their time in the yard, okay? So it's, it's like a complete structured environment, okay? Just think about it. Think about a prisoner who there's a term for it who's been institutionalized, okay? They've been in jail all of their adult life. They've been in jail, let's say, 30 years. Now they're 48 years old, and they get turned loose on society, okay? What do I do? How do I get a job? How do I feed myself? How do I do all of these things? I have no life skills. I've been institutionalized. I showed up and put a plate out, and food was put on it. I went to a cell, I had a place to sleep. Everything was taken care of, and my entire day was accounted for. Now there's no structure. What happens? Okay, if you've got executive functioning impairment, that is a recipe for disaster, okay? Never mind high school, put that aside for a minute. They also no longer have the structure, if they're going away to school, that their parents have been providing for them in terms of the set of rules that you keep in your house. Uh, those of you who go into your kid's room every morning to wake them up because they can't get up on their own to go to school, okay? How about the fact that um, you may be managing their medication for them, okay? Um, that is a significant change that they're gonna be facing when they go off. Also, you have to understand that in college, in most colleges, class attendance, for instance, is optional. So if they don't feel like going, they won't go. If they can't get up, they won't go. It's easy to fall behind. When I was running the uh, EDGE Foundation, I would get calls every late October, <clears throat> early November from kids or their parents because they were crashing and burning in college, okay? I'm gonna lose my academic scholarship, I'm on probation, uh, everything was a nightmare because they're not used to this life, okay? You also have to remember that there's a complete lack of feedback that they're getting, okay? In, in high school, you get a quiz every couple of days. Uh, you've got assignments to turn in for a grade every couple of days. They know where they stand, even if they don't like it, okay? In a lot of classes in college, maybe you get a midterm and a final, and that's it. And they don't know how badly they're doing until they're failing. And that's a huge problem, okay? There's no structure, support, and accountability. Those are three things that everyone with an executive functioning impairment or ADHD or learning disability absolutely needs to survive, okay? And one of the issues with medication management is the potential for diversion of their medication that has additional consequences that I'll talk about a little bit later. All right, 
It's a difficult transition factually uh, because of those social changes I just talked about. Also, there are significant changes in the law that you need to know about. And since this was, uh, I'm trying to give you a better rounded picture of what your kids are going through. But this is also tabbed as a legal presentation, so I'm going to have to give you some law. Okay? <laughs> Um, the legal changes are for all students, but they impact kids with disabilities much more significantly. Um, and they need to be addressed proactively. All right. They're magnified by these uh, transition issues are magnified by uh, ADHD, LD, and co-occurring conditions, lack of structure, support, accountability, <coughs> inability, and unwillingness to advocate for themselves. A lot of these kids if they had ADHD or they had a learning disability, it was the thing that wasn't really talked about in the house. And I have to tell you as parents, silence breeds shame. And you have to know that, especially when it comes down to a disability or a number of disabilities that impact their sense of self-esteem. Okay, that's number one. But as a practical matter, the law requires that when they graduate high school that they have to self-report their disability and they have to seek services with the disability office, okay? And many of these kids, their parents have been doing all of the advocacy for them going through K to 12, and they are ill-equipped, and many of them are unwilling. I used to speak to a lot of college kids when I was running the Edge Foundation, and they would say things like, you know what? Dyslexia was something my parents told me I had, and always made me feel broken. When I go to college, I just want to fit in. I just want to be like everybody else. The last thing I want to do is tell somebody I have a disability. The last thing I want to do is um, uh, self-report or register with the disability office. And, and it's interesting because colleges have a budget for special services, okay? There's a disability services office. And their biggest problem is not whether or not they should give these kids the accommodations that they're asking for. Their biggest problem is nobody's coming into their office, okay? The kids don't show up and ask for help. That's a problem, okay? Um, I spoke to someone who runs a unique program at uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And she was telling me they had a coaching program. They also tried a program where they would have like a study boot, midterm boot camp for kids with uh, disabilities. Nobody showed up. They had a midterm boot camp for freshmen. Everybody showed up, okay? Nobody wants to be singled out. Because of the social statements, because of, and, and many parents wanting to protect their kids, by not talking about their disabilities or not wanting to label their kids are unwittingly fueling those stigmas by kind of saying, yes, this is something we need to hide from. I am extremely public about my ADHD because I think it's important, okay? I bring it up and people don't want to hear it because it's so stigmatized. That's part of the problem. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it's ADHD is not something we need to apologize for. Learning disabilities are not something we need to apologize for. Perhaps, many times, the things we do because of our ADHD or our learning disability are things we need to own and apologize for or make up for. However, there's a significant difference in who we are versus what we do, okay? And that's really also important that we keep that frame of reference. Um, parents, by nature, and I'm guilty of this myself, praise or punish our kids for what they do. It's rare that we take a moment to say, I love you because of who you are, or make them understand that. There's a significant difference. And it's hard because you are evaluating, you are raising them, you're teaching them how to get through their lives. So you have to kind of uh, call them on their behavior. As a teacher, you have to evaluate their behavior, and it's difficult. But there is a proactive way around that that I'm going to talk about tonight. Right. Um, so these kids, in many cases, not only are unable to articulate their own disability and seek services or, or accommodations, but they're unwilling to do it. Um, there's an absence of feedback, no daily support from their parents, and uh, obviously the huge changes in the law that we're getting to now. All of these together equal a recipe for disaster for these kids when they leave the house. Remember this kid? Okay. Remember all the things he had to remember? 
the lunch money, the papers. Okay, now he goes off to college. There are life skills that he's got to worry about. It's not just about whether or not he understands his psychology work. He's got to do his own laundry now. Okay? Is he getting enough sleep? Um, is he eating regularly? Who's managing his meds? And we will often find that kids that go off to college where their parents were managing their medication at home will say, I'm not, I don't think I need the medication as much as my parents did, so I'm going to take it when I think I need it. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll be the first one to say, nobody knows them and their bodies and how they process things like they do. And as parents and as advocates, we should defer to them. But my position is, then guess what? If you don't think you need your medication as often as you've been taking it, then let's you and me and your doctor put together a new medication plan based upon what you think, okay? That's important information. When I say talk to your kids and how crucial it is, they should drive this process. Nobody knows their disability, because you have to understand, a learning disability doesn't automatically give you the right to have services or accommodations at college or in high school, okay? You still have to show how that disability is holding you back, okay? You have to show, and the legal standard is, how it substantially impacts a major life activity. Now, you can read about ADHD, you can go to understood.org and read about learning disabilities and ADHD. You can go to Chad's website, the National Resource Center on Disabilities. You can go to Smart Kids with LD and learn about these disabilities. But nobody knows how they impact your kid better than your kid. Okay? Have that conversation. And I can tell you, as a kid who grew up with undiagnosed ADHD, that it's tremendously empowering for them to be able to, ex and not having this process swirl around them, but they are an active participant in it, and it provides them with, the one word I would use is empowerment, okay? And that's really important for a disability that permeates their sense of self-esteem to the extent that they feel powerless all the time, okay? <clears throat> this is a way around that. Um, also, they may get romantically involved in college, there may be sports involved, they may be getting a job. All of these life skills are coming into play. And if they are failing, it may not be because they don't understand the material. It may mean that they have difficulty balancing all of these things, okay? And those life skills are crucial. It's the first time they are on their own without you, okay? Recognize that. Okay. Changes in the law, services and accommodations. Essentially, there are four laws that we're going to talk about tonight. The top three, um, the, Amer uh, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, is the only one of them that's actually an education statute. Uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act are essentially anti-discrimination legislation that essentially says you can't be discriminated against because of your disability. Um, this is also a gross understatement, but thinking of those top three, um, IDEA typically, kids will get an, an IEP, an Individualized Education Program, that deals usually in special education services, okay? You can get accommodations in an IEP as well. 504 plans typically um, will involve accommodations. You can also get services under a 504 plan. The ADA essentially talks about who is responsible to provide those services and who is can be the recipient of those services. Okay, and we're also going to talk about in high school or actually K to 12, your best friend as parents is the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. FERPA, okay? Which is going to become your enemy when your kids graduate, and I'll tell you why. Okay. I said this earlier, but it bears repeating. A diagnosis of ADHD or a learning disability in and of itself does not guarantee you services, okay? You still have to show that how they substantially impact a major life activity. You have to draw that nexus. 
Okay? That's really crucial. Now, the key difference in those top three educational statutes, IDEA, Section 504, and the American Disabilities Act, at the K-12 level, have a component in them referred to as child find. Okay? What child find is, is a component in the law which says that students from kindergarten to 12th grade, it is the responsibility of the local education agency or the school district to identify those kids, find out what their learning disabilities are uh, or their um, mental health disorders are, what their challenges are, evaluate them and provide services or accommodations. It is the responsibility the legal responsibility of the school district to do that, okay? Even for kids who may be attending a private school but still live in that uh, school district, even for kids who are too young to attend the school, pre there's a, a committee for preschool special education, CPSE, okay? Um, it's the legal responsibility of the school district. And when services are not being provided, and I'm advocating for a student or we are challenging the district's policy in an impartial hearing, essentially we're saying in most cases that this was a failure of child fine, their obligation under that statute. The school is required to provide, and you will hear this very often when you read and hear about uh, special education, it's what we refer to as FAPE, a free appropriate public education. That's the buzzword, okay? What's appropriate? Sometimes that is uh, something that has to be decided by a court. But uh, that is essentially the standard, okay? Now, going to post-secondary. The services and supports that they get under IDEA, okay, when they graduate high school, are gone. Poof. Vaporized, okay? 504 and the ADA still apply but they apply very differently. Because in both cases, child fine ends. You can still get services pursuant to 504 or through the Americans with Disabilities Act. However, the burden is now yours as the student, or if you're an adult, as the employee. You have to self-report your disability, you have to document it and provide documentation, and you have to ask for specific accommodations, okay? That is very important. Um, and this is where a lot of kids trip over this. Yes, sir? Question, I, I realize IDEA is gone, but is there a value in the record of the IEP for the accommodations page as a child may have had in their later years in high school when they approached the Office of Disability Services? Is that ever used a record of there? Good question. The question was, and I'll repeat that, That's a good question. is, uh, is the IEP that is now gone of value when they transfer from high school to college? And it's an excellent question. And the reason is, the law requires you, and we're going to get there in the slides, but the law requires that the school have a transition plan for kids with um, uh, an IEP. And if you have a 504 plan, while the college is not bound by the 504 plan that you had in high school, you actually have a working document, okay? And I suggest to parents of kids with learning disabilities and kids with ADHD, uh, when you are shopping for colleges, you should really be shopping for disability offices. What's the school's policy? Are they an open-minded school? There are a number of websites, and um, the EDGE Foundation used to keep publications on disability-friendly colleges. Uh, I've spoken at Lynn University in uh, Florida has a wonderful open-minded policy about kids with special needs and providing services. Landmark College. Um, uh, there are a number of them around. Mitchell College is the other one I was trying to think of. Uh, and there are a number of them. Uh, there is another problem that you face when you are talking about post-secondary accommodations, but um, it's really important that you understand that while the college disability office, like you said, isn't necessarily bound by what you had in high school, you have a launching pad. You have services. This is what he got. This is why he needed them. This is what the school agreed to. You have a starting point that's very, very important. Okay? Do you have a question, ma'am?
Well, the question was, uh, her particular situation is that she's trying to convert the IEP into a 504 plan for senior year of high school, and the school is not cooperating because they say it's not necessary. Okay, um, that is a little bit of a different situation um, because what you want to do is, and we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, um, but what you want to do is when you have an IEP under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act between the ages of 14 and 16, the school is required to, to uh, start with you a transition plan. And by all means, I recommend that you know, advocacy certainly should begin in the home. Uh, at the earliest possible age, and your children should be learning about the, the supports and services that you're asking for on their behalf. They should be involved in that process, and certainly at the transition plan time frame, that should really be the passing of the torch of, uh, of their self-advocacy and them moving forward to college. And I don't know if it's necessary in, in every case to convert your IEP to a 504 plan before you go to college because there's no such thing as a 504 plan in college. You can get services there. What, you, what I would suggest would be uh, keep the IEP and ask for transition meetings and discuss based upon his, his or her IEP what accommodations they should be asking for when they get to college. I would also, when you're looking at colleges and talking to disability offices, I would bring the IEP and say, based upon what they've been getting in their IEP, what do you have available in terms of note taking, in terms of having exams being read to them, in terms of extended time, whatever those services are, and start thinking as you're moving into the transition process, what are they going to need? I know my son or daughter. Or ask them, what are you most afraid about when you get to college? Okay, let's see if we can address that as we're looking at schools. Uh, that's really important. And again, in involve them actively. Um, convert their services uh, into uh, accommodations or possible services that they may be entitled to in college. Um, again, we talked about the fact that the College is not bound by the high school 504 plan, but it still has, you have an example of what's worked. You have a, a document to bring them, a starting point, and that's really significant. Okay, <clears throat> students are reluctant to report. We talked about this earlier because parents have done all the advocacy up until now. They just want to fit in. They don't, many of them don't understand their needs. Um, they're not comfortable articulating their needs. Um, if they are coming from a household where parents are afraid to label them, they are going to be extremely reluctant to label themselves. Um, you have to understand that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about FERPA, Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. Yes, ma'am. I'm concerned about um, schools discriminating because she's got an IEP and special needs, but her grades are phenomenal. So is that going to be, because you have, they're going to know because she's got resource room that she's special ed, right? The question was if you, uh, your child has, your child has special education services, and this is an important point, um, uh, the college may know, and that's going to negatively impact that. Number one, if you're at all concerned about a school holding their disability against them, I suggest to you that that's probably not the right school for them if they have a disability and they need those supports. Um, I think that what you want to do is you want to be as transparent as you can be because it doesn't help you right. to shove them into Princeton so they can crash and burn because they're not getting those services, okay? I will tell you that there was an extremely high level of anxiety with my son going on to college, okay? To the extent that we, when we went to one of those parent meetings, couldn't even look at my wife because I could feel her anxiety level. My son has an anxiety disorder, okay? And I said to her, he's gonna pick up on this. And I, and I have to tell you, the one thing I learned in that process is most parents think of two things. Number one, they wanna push their kid to reach their potential. You can do better, you're not applying yourself. Uh, and I will tell you as someone with 
ADHD who grew up when we didn't understand what it was. I say this a lot, that when I was young, they didn't call it ADD, they called it BAD. They were good yeah. kids, bad kids. And I went to Catholic school, I was left-handed, it was horrible, okay? So, you know, that's, a, and, and a sensory processing disorder where nobody could read my writing and I didn't want to write, okay? So uh, the bottom line is that parents will typically do this because they want to push their kids to do better. The problem is without those supports in place and going to that unstructured environment, these kids will crash and burn. And the one thing I learned in that process is more important is it's got to be to a certain degree a gut call. Is this a school that they're going to feel comfortable in? and that they're going to do well in, for whatever reason, okay? Um, I, I really think that is a, when we went with my son, he got accepted at this small liberal arts college that no one's ever heard of in Ohio. And the, the president of the school was speaking to the accepted students, and he said something that I really thought was prolific. He said, look, for the last two years, you've been worrying about your SAT scores and your grades and your resumes and your parents pushing you. He said, all that's out the window now. You've been accepted here. It's gonna come down to one thing, a gut call. Is this home or not? And nobody can tell you that except you, okay? And when the guy finished and we kind of walked out, my son came running up to me and said, Dad, what do you think? I said, I think the guy's actually right. I mean, I think you have to decide, is this home? You know, this program, they, they have to do an independent study and, and write a thesis. It's not for everyone. But if you've got that sense, it doesn't matter where the school ranked because, you know what, in 10 years, it's not going to matter where you went undergrad anyway. Yes, ma'am. Right, but so but they often lack insight into what they need in order to do well. Yes. So they, where they might be comfortable, might make them Well, it, I think the question was, you know, how do you make that determination is what's good for them and what's going to help them as a student uh, versus, you know, what's best for them. And I think, look, I mean, if your son or daughter said, I really feel comfortable at this school, and you know it's a major party school, then I would say, you know what, that's probably why they feel comfortable. That's probably why I don't want them to go there. Um, but I think versus, you know, pushing them to get into a higher school and a higher school and a higher school, and many times, unconsciously, the parents like to say, my kid's going to Georgetown or whatever it is. And so I think that, you know, you have to, you can also kind of sense when you go see a lot of these schools, the amount of tension or stress that some of these kids are under. Uh, and I think that, you know, when your kid spends a weekend at the school uh, to kind of see what the older kids and what the environment is like, I think maybe there's some parameters that you could develop with your child in terms of, you know, you list five criteria, some that they feel comfortable with and others that they don't. There's got to be some schools where there's overlap based upon what you think uh, would be a good idea versus what they think is going to be a good idea because the bottom line is if you're pushing them into a school that they're not comfortable with, a lot of times parents will talk about you know, we're making an investment, and it's a substantial investment in their future, okay? Money is part of the investment, but you're also making an investment in their self-esteem. And when they crash and burn because they couldn't handle a certain school that you might have kind of were nudging them to, um, it's not like you can ever recoup that investment in terms of them kind of failing and having to come home or go to another place or something like that. So, and I don't have the right answer for you. I think these are things that you have to think about um, and kind of swish around. It depends on a lot of factors. Yes. Do you really want the world knowing, now this guy's in the 60s, that your son has a disability? Because if that shows up on their resume, everyone's going to know. Loaded question, but a good one. It's a, it, it is a good question in terms of you know people telling you you really want your child label. And, and uh, it, it, it actually kind of upset, upsets me to a certain degree because I have been involved with a number of litigations against school districts where school districts will exploit 
those concerns that parents have and say, you know what, we, we could classify this kid for special ed, but do you really want that? Do you really want us to label him so it follows him? And, and, and it makes me angry because we're, we're talking again about stepping backward. We're talking again about those disabilities. I think that really the ultimate decision is who's got the best services for him, who's gonna, which school is gonna be an environment where he feels less uncomfortable going and asking for help. Um, and I think those are the, um, and you know, is he gonna feel as if he's ostracizing himself from his friends or roommates by going to the disability center? Um, you know, the disability center can be a wonderful place, but if he never goes, it's not gonna help him at all. Uh, and those are the things, I wish I had a magic formula for you. But it's just these are things that you have to think about, and the mm -hmm. earlier you start <laughs> thinking about them, the better off you and your child will be. Yes, I see a question back there. Oh, well, I was going to add that, like, as a college student, I can say, like, your journey is continuously changing with all the different classes you take. And so, like, just for what she was saying, like, do you really want that to follow your son? Like, if they go to that school, they can always change their school. Like, they can learn how to work with their ADHD at a school, maybe go to a school known for, like, working with disabilities and go there for just two years. And then, like, what they learn from that, then they can go to your good school. But, like, it doesn't matter because if you're resilient enough, like, what school you go to won't matter, but I think, you can change how you I think that's an excellent point. And I think that it really is, it depends on a lot of things. Another option is some kids will take a gap year yeah. and decide where they want to go. Some kids will go to a junior college as a way to phase into a four-year school. And the, the, the real message that I have for you is explore all of those options by talking to your kid, okay? Um, they are a lot more perceptive than sometimes we give them credit for and they know themselves better than we do. Um, you still have to be parents, and you have to strike that balance, certainly. But these are conversations that you need to have, because there are alternatives out there, and we're gonna talk about another one in a minute that can apply to kids that are commuting from home, or kids that are going to school away somewhere. Yes, Mary, you have a question? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would just like to make a comment to that mother about that educator and administrator. I'm really very that someone like that yeah. is in that position. It was a, it was a pastor. pastor who doesn't understand LD, and I forgive him. He's a 60 year old pastor. I mean, take it from yeah, but, but somebody, but then I'd still like to make the comment because mm -hmm. someone should not be passing judgment mm -hmm. like that on someone. Just to kind of get us back to where we were, <laughs> yeah. I totally understand that I totally agree with you there. Um, but the, the, the issue, more importantly, is. It's a good uh, thing that you brought that up because that's one of the minds that are out there in the minefield. Okay. That's one of the things, right, that's one of the things that we're talking about, you know, it's a problem, it's out there, if I step on it, it's gonna hurt, but if I know it's out there, maybe I'll step a little more cautiously, um, you know, in terms of thinking about that, yes. Just a quick question, so as a child and is looking at that um, selection of schools, is it, um, it's pretty hard to get some information about student disability services yeah. online. Some schools are great at providing that. You can certainly look at resources. But you know, if a child has like ten <coughs> schools that they're kind of interested in, is it appropriate as a parent to call the student disability services and have a conversation yeah. about really what they provide? Or yeah. yes, it is. In your, okay. As a matter of fact, I would even go a okay. step further. The question was: Is it appropriate for a parent? to uh, call the disability office. Now, there may be limitations on what you'd be able to do over the phone. Mm -hmm. However, think about this from a straight consumer perspective for a moment, okay? There's a huge buzzword in colleges called retention, okay? <laughs> they want your money. They want your money for a longer period of time, okay? You are a consumer as a parent with the checkbook. When you go look at these schools, it is entirely appropriate. Not only is it entirely appropriate, I would encourage you to absolutely, when you go visit that school, the first place is, let's see where the disability office is. Let's talk to somebody in the disability <coughs> office. How close is the disability office to the dorms? Okay, these things that you might take for granted. 
Uh, it's all the way on the other side of campus. I didn't want to go. You know, I mean, these are things you know your kid. You know what they kind of, making it as easy or as accessible as possible, that could be part of the equation that you're putting together. Yes? A, a, a comment that I would add to that also is that a lot of colleges are adding special programs for kids that trans transition them, quote unquote, from high school to college, which translates to it's a program that lasts for your freshman year and then it's gone. Uh -huh. So it's attracting a lot of kids who and who can't up their game that quickly, mm -hmm. and so when they get into into their second sophomore year, they end up <coughs> doing that crashing and burn. They still crash and burn. It's just put off by another year. That was an interesting point that yeah. someone brought up. That you know some schools have more transition programs for freshmen, uh, but some kids need more and will crash and burn. It'll just be a delayed effect, and that does happen. I would I, I would venture to guess. The schools that do that will probably have a lower attrition rate because some of this is a maturity issue and some of this, these learning disabilities, you also have to understand that there is a lag with ADHD and certain learning disabilities of social maturity that is about 30% behind their peers. And sometimes they're not ready for asking for help in first year, sometimes it takes them that transition into second year, uh, sometimes it's not until you know, uh, they're 23 years old. They, they've crashed and burned so badly that now that they, you know, they're willing to go see a doctor or maybe get diagnosed. So there are a number of these things that you kind of have to look at. Uh, but that is a very interesting point. Yes, sir. Yeah, just pick up on that. I, I've probably visited a few dozen of those types of programs around the country where it's a, they're not the Office of Disability Services, but they, the school will run a program for an additional fee, $3,000 more a semester or whatever. And you can carry it through your senior year, even, whether you'll get executive function coaching and tutoring, whether it's a peer or an experienced teacher. Um, and they're, they're scattered around the country. Somebody mentioned Courier, Curry earlier, um, but there are ones the, in the West and the SALT uh, program down in Arizona. Um, and across, across the country, one in Arkansas in the middle of nowhere where you can't get a drink. I wouldn't recommend it. But, <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's also um, something else that you can do, I'm going to talk to in terms of pro some proactive strategies in a moment, and that is essentially having a child work with a coach that's their own coach, that's independent of the school, that is tremendously empowering, uh, and there are a number of good resources out there, and you should understand how that process works. Uh, is it covered by tuition? That. The uh, ultimate question. You know, usually this is something that you would do individually what, what for your coach child. You mean? I will talk about that when I'm going to get there in a second. Okay. Right? Uh, so I'm just going to move on a little bit. Um, let's see. Okay, FERPA. That's where we left off. FERPA is your best friend as a parent in the K-12 range because Family Education Rights and Privacy Act guarantees you, as a parent of a kid from kindergarten to 12th grade, exclusive, secret, unfettered access to their education file. Okay? You are entitled to it. No one else is supposed to see it. It's secure. Uh, there are seats if you want to filter in. Okay. Do you want an attorney team? That's the problem. Because yeah. this yeah. presentation is about transitions. The problem is, remember before when I said that FERP is your best friend when they're in K-12? Well, guess what? When they graduate, that exclusive, unfettered, secret right to their education file, is no longer yours as their parent. It's theirs because they're an adult now. Wait, okay. When they graduate, when they Well, technically, it's when they graduate high school into post-secondary. There is an exception if they are not 18 yet. There's also another exception under the law if they're still a dependent on uh, your tax return. However, when they go to college, you, as the advocate for those kids, are now out of the loop unless you do something proactively, okay? And that's really important. And again, that's one of the reoccurring themes of what I'm talking about tonight, okay? Um, you can't advocate for your kids, and this is a problem parents have, but I'm paying the bill. I'm paying the tuition. What do you mean I can't get information, okay? Unless you proactively 
Talk to your kids. Have that discussion. They can sign a FERPA waiver, okay? And even if they say no, I want to do this on my own, guess what? You've had the conversation, okay? You've discussed it. Now, there are a couple of caveats here. And one of them is, if your kid signs the FERPA waiver, it's not like high school, okay? In high school, you might get a call from the principal. You know, Johnny's not been doing so good in algebra. Is everything okay at home that we're concerned about, okay? That does not happen at the college level. Legally speaking, the FERPA waiver, all it does is allow the school to talk to you when you call them up. But you still have to initiate that process, okay? That's really important that you understand. Yes? Just, just to clarify, does the, if the child signs the FERPA, does that allow you then to have access to their K-12 through 12 records as well? Or that, you know? This is when they're in college. Oh, okay. You've already got that right when yeah. they were young. Okay. You don't need a waiver from them when they're in high school, okay. okay? So now when they're at college, address this with them. How are we gonna do this? Are you gonna advocate for yourself? Are we gonna be involved? Are you gonna need our support? Um, you know, what's going on? These are issues that you should address before you get chased through that minefield blindfolded. So That's could very we like, access their grades electronically, like through power school sort of thing, in college? Um, usually not, okay? So Usually, how do we know? well, you can contact the school. Mm -hmm. You can okay. speak to. You can ask for the disability office. You can ask for. There's usually a dean whose job is to deal with parents. Okay, <laughs> and, well, and it's usually the it's lower fun. of the dean rankings. <laughs> okay, <laughs> to deal with the you know the neurotic parents. Exactly. Um, but again, if you call and there's no waiver in the file, they won't speak to you, and they'll tell you we can't speak to you legally. There's nothing we can do. You're out. Do they, do they have to be identified? What about the normal daughter who might get scattered? This is for everybody. This okay. is not limited to kids with disabilities. No, this is the law. When you go from high school to college and you turn 18, the, they are an adult now, and it is their right, not yours. Yes? So let's say you have the conversation, and I'll broaden this to all the kids, whether they do or don't have a learning disability, and your kid turns around and says, I don't want to sign the waiver. I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. On that so page. then the logical <laughs> recommend, the one thing I can 100, 1,000% 1, 1, recommend is having a conversation, yeah, okay? I, I, if I had the answer to what your kid was going to do, or if I had the answer to how you get him to do what you want, I, I, I wouldn't be standing here <laughs> right now. So you, you got to remember the magic wand they told you about before, I don't have one, I wish, okay? So, so, you know, but I think that, you know, you deal with that, maybe you come to some kind of compromise. Well, you know, the first year, if, you know, we'll, you, we'll let you try this on your own. The second year, if you want us to continue to pay, then we're going to have to work together or something like that. I mean, there are a number of things you can do to address that. But, and you may not like what you hear to your child, from your child, but the point that I'm making is, what I can guarantee you is, Regardless of what your son and daughter says or agrees or disagrees with, if you have that conversation when they go off to school, you know where you stand, okay? If you didn't hear this lecture tonight and you never had that conversation with your kid and you called up the school, well, what am I paying you all this money for? I, I want to know. How are they doing? You know, what's going on? You, you don't know, all right? Um, yes, ma'am. First of all, what I would recommend is a completely proactive, transparent process. When you are looking at these colleges and you're visiting these um, disability services offices, okay, I would talk to them about that. At that, what do you have available? This is his 504 plan. This is his IEP, and um, you know we've discussed it. He wants us to be involved with his advocacy. What's the school's? No, no, no. Um, typically, what will happen is there will be probably some <coughs> freshman orientation for parents, 
Um, but, and they will talk about it there, and just basically to make sure you know that we can't talk to you unless certain things are done here. Um, and most schools will have their own form, okay? It should come with the packet, but I wouldn't waste that time. I would ask about it when you're looking. Be ahead of the game. Have the conversation. Know what you're dealing with. I mean, this really can have a lot of pitfalls, and the more information you have, the better you, off you are. Yes, ma'am? I was just going to say, some people may not realize that you also don't see your children's grades unless no. uh, something is the child signs that, and you also won't know if your child is in the hospital right. because right. of what you know, because of HIPAA, you know, if they're at right. So that also is something that, you know, you can decide whether you want to, uh, I think it's okay, I've gotten more, um, I've gotten less liberal, you know. <laughs> it's like, you know what, I'm paying for you to go to college. I want to know if you're in the hospital, you know. I mean, I want to know, and I want to be able to see your grades. I don't, you know, I don't want to go four years without having any sense of how you're doing, you know. I haven't made anybody sign that yet, but I'm <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think this is an excellent discussion because there's no right or wrong answer, but we're figuring this out. I mean, there are different ways you can approach it. Yes, ma'am. Um, I can share with you because I have one thing on already. They have the system, and they don't, you don't get any information, you don't even get a bill. So the kid has to go actually in the system, get a bill, pay for it. Otherwise, they could kick out college. It's not, not that we can get the kids to sign an agreement or not. Well, that, uh, the, the, the comment, I think, was that sometimes the kids get the bill, and you might not even get the bill. It depends on the school. I will tell you. They, they I, have to allow you. They have to, so the kid has to allow you to be an authorized payer. It depends on some of the schools. The, the, that can vary. I will tell you that I have uh, I've gotten a lot of bills uh, from my son's school, and I know a lot of parents whose kids have not signed waivers that have gotten bills. It varies uh, because the school feels that processing payment is not the same as educational file work. So, uh, but again, you need to address this going in. And that's really what the bottom line is. Yes. I know it's a little drastic instead of a purpose, a conservatorship even on options. Uh, well, that's a much more drastic step, and that would be to get some kind of a guardianship. And, and, and I would tell you, if you are at the level where you want to get some kind of an active guardianship, it's probably not a good idea for your child to go away to school uh, because there may be specific health issues or other issues that you need to address. Um, that's that, that's a, that an extreme that we don't see a whole lot of. Right, I'm just going to move on. Yes. Just back on if the child's going to, actually the young adult is going to the Office of Disability Services to request services, what are your thoughts on having them bring any third party evaluation that they may have had, uh, neuropsych, or something that might right. help provide evidence to get uh, tutor or whatever they might Well, not have. only is that a good idea, the question was, what about you know, them bringing evaluations? Not only is it a good idea, it's required under the law is that they have to self-report their disability, they have to register with the disability office, and in order to qualify for services in many cases, they have to provide evals uh, and you know all of the educational testing that's been done. And we're gonna talk a little bit about getting, if you can, a fresh evaluation before you go off to college. Because you have a right under IDEA in Section 504 to have the high school do it for you and you don't have to pay for it. Really? When you get to yeah. college, mm -hmm. It's up to you. So the fresher your evaluations are, the better off you are, and that's another proactive step that we're going to get yeah, to. Yeah, but can you trust the high school's evaluation? Yeah. Well, yeah. you may or may not be able to trust the high school's evaluation, but the bottom line is that the evaluation we're talking about now is kind of like an evaluation as they're leaving the high school, and it's helping them get <laughs> services as they go somewhere else. So essentially, one of the proactive things I would suggest to you is that if you've had difficulty getting services, uh, and this comes up a lot of times with high stakes testing, and you've kind of butted heads with the, the high school uh, administration, which does happen, that's why I'm in business, is to essentially one of your tactics could be, this is kind of our exit strategy here. Okay, we're going to be out of your hair. Help us get the accommodations for the SAT. We're, you know, looking to get uh, transition services at the, the college. This is not something that's going to impact you directly. You would be surprised at how you can kind of 
weave some support from the high school if it's not, you know, I want you to pay for a private placement that's going to cost $60,000 a year. There are things that you can do that will kind of, you know, you can kind of line up. Again, we need your help because we need services from the college, not that we need them from you. Yes? You need to find fresh. Yes, typically, typically under the law, the time frame for uh, evaluations, barring drastic changes, uh, is about three years. Okay, and and I will tell you as we get to high stakes testing, which is kind of coming up here, is that there are some strategies that you need to kind of think about ahead of time in terms of evals uh, that may help you. Yes. Just with the evaluations, you want to make sure that. It's the adult evaluation because some of the universities won't take the child evaluation right? before 16. Right, nothing before 16. Right. What does that mean? They're not required in senior year. They are required to do them when you request them. They don't have to do them more than every three years unless you can establish that there's a change in circumstances. But if you know you're coming up against high school, you may want to sit down and have a meeting and request one. Uh, and to the extent that they say no, you may have something to kind of litigate over. Yes? Just a quick question. It's a technicality that my daughter's um, trainee is actually in May of her senior year. Mm -hmm. So that could be for the school to say, she's on her way. We're not going to put the time and money into that. Good point. Versus that transition plan. Exactly. What's the, re what's the legal requirement of the school? to have to provide that as a transition plan? What I would do is I would request it as part of your transition plan if the school is opposed to doing it uh, because whatever services there are, it could be part of, you know, we've got services now and we're looking to get accommodations when we go to college and we need a fresh um, evaluation in order to establish that. You may have to fight with the school over it. That depends on your relationship with the, the district. But that would be the tactic I would use to try and get that fresher evaluation. I just want to move forward in some of the slides and I can take some of these questions afterwards. What's that? Sometimes the, co the colleges will require that it be an adult evaluation exactly. for them. If you have an evaluation from them when they were in middle school or right. something that was done by a child psychologist, you may need oh, something oh, for oh, them oh. reflecting the services that they need as an adult. What's considered okay. an adult, 18? No, uh, it could be an adolescent. It could be, I would say, somewhere in high school. But it depends on the evaluation okay, that you're so. getting. Thank you. All right. Um, proactive. Have that conversation with your child. Speak to the DSS office. Um, have your child sign a waiver if you're going to stay in the loop. If not, unless you, at least you know. Um, medication management. This is very important. Medication is not a mag magic bullet. Uh, it's very important that you have a medication plan uh, that you all agree on. And if your child thinks that the plan is too onerous and they don't need the medication as much, then you should discuss that and form another medication plan for when they go to college. Talk about um, what resources are available if they go to school in Nebraska. What if they need to get a prescription? Is there a psychiatrist in the area? Does the school provide certain services? Do they refer them to certain uh, clinicians? These are things you have to look about. Look at. Ask your doctor here, maybe, is there someone whose name you can give us in that jurisdiction. I belong to a number of associations that have listservs and we have people all around the country if someone contacts me about a case in Iowa, for instance. So, you know, look into that if your child is going to need tinkering with their meds, right? All right. Diversion. That is the diversion of ADHD medication or prescription medication to those who it's not prescribed for and uh, who's taking it's not supervised by a doctor, okay? Stimulant medication, which is probably the most um, common form of ADHD medication, is a Schedule II controlled substance, okay? Under the law, and I am a former prosecutor and a criminal defense attorney, I do that as well, I can tell you right now, the law does not require that any money change hands for it to be considered the sale of a controlled substance. 
So if someone pops their head in your child's dorm room and says, can I take one of your pills? I've got a paper I'm, or something I'm studying for, and they give that pill, it is considered the sale of a controlled substance, which is a felony in every single state. It subjects them to school discipline, potential expulsion. Uh, it also subjects them to criminal prosecution. And also it feeds into the stigmas that these medications aren't really necessary, that they are social, or we're getting these kids somehow stoned or whatever. And a lot of these kids can't function without their medication, especially if they're away from home, they have executive functioning impairment, and they can't function without their medication as one of the components of how they address their learning disability or ADHD, okay? Um, what can students do? Have that conversation with your child. They should safeguard their medication. Never share it with anyone. Um, I take Lipitor for, um, for uh, cholesterol, okay? Now, every six months or so, my doctor checks my liver to make sure that there's no side effect. Any medication can have a side effect, okay? Even if it's a safe medication, okay? The medication that's being taken without the supervision of a doctor that's not being prescribed by a doctor is a disaster, okay? Just be aware of that, all right? Educate your children. Um, report changes in medication as they get older. Sometimes the medication may impact them differently. Sometimes the doses or the types of medications may have to change. Make sure you stay on top of that, okay? And give them the tools they're going to need. All right. Addressing transition proactively, we're going to talk about coaching now. ADHD or executive functioning coaching, okay? I am not educated as a coach, but I've been coached very successfully. I ran an organization that provided, it was a nonprofit that provided coaches for high school and college students throughout the country. We had a panel of 150 some odd coaches, okay? Now, this is not coaching in the sense of you kind of want your child to do well. This is a very specialized um, skill set that these coaches employ. Um, okay, it's a partnership between a student and a coach. Um, it's student-driven and it's talent-based. These kids have been told every day when they've been in elementary school, in middle school, in high school, they're doing something not as fast as the other kids. They're not turning in their assign assignments uh, in the best way that they can. They've constantly been getting negative feedback. This model is a talent-based model. The coaches employ typically what's known as a non-directive questioning approach. They pull information from their students, okay? And they don't tell them what to do. They don't teach them anything, and they don't mentor them. Mentoring essentially means you have someone emulate uh, <laughs> your behavior, okay? These coaches pull from these students and make them understand that they are talented at certain things, and that there are certain things that they're challenged by. And the whole dance that we do as people with disabilities is learning to gravitate towards our strengths and learning to navigate around the things that challenge us, okay? I'm standing up here speaking to you tonight because I'm a good speaker. I'm comfortable when I'm up here in front of people giving you information. If I had to sit down and write a report, that would be a nightmare, okay? Uh, it's about learning what you do well and gravitate towards that. Now, the student selects goals. They're the student's goals, not the parent's goals, not the coach's goals. And the student and the coach develop a plan to achieve those goals, okay? And along the way, the student and the coach hold the student accountable to things that they've committed to doing, the student themselves have committed to doing. And the one thing that is completely missing in this equation is judgment. There is absolutely no judgment. <coughs> if things didn't work, we take a look at why, and maybe we go in a different direction. And you have to also understand that the coaching model is really an executive life coaching model that has been modified specifically to address executive functioning impairment, okay? So it's not about making sure they get a better report card or making sure it may be about having them learn to balance their social life with their academic stuff, okay? And what I used to tell seniors or college students that would call me when I was running the Edge Foundation essentially was, 
this is a great way to get your parents off your back. Because as a parent, the most challenging thing you have to face right now is my son or daughter is going off to college. They're at an age where they should stand or fall on their own. And I may have to take a step back. But how do I do that without feeling like I'm abandoning my child? Especially if they have special needs. And the bottom line is a coach is one way that you can have them have support. The whole goal here is to have them develop structure, support, and accountability on their own. The coach doesn't do it for them, and the <coughs> coach's goal really is to get fired so they can continue to do this on their own. And if I had to sum it up in one word, I would say certainly empowerment would be uh, the best thing. And before I take a question, I'm just going to give you a quick story. When my son was in preschool, we brought him to a, uh, a, a, a preschool place that was across the street from my office, literally 30 feet away. Okay? All I had to do was pick him up at 5.30 every single night. Okay? I was late every night. <laughs> I am horribly time challenged. Okay? Um, to the extent there are times my wife wants to throw me out a closed window, okay? And part of my ADHD, I'm very impulsive. I have every kind of gadget you can imagine. Uh, buzzers, beepers, alarms, all kinds of things. And we also, many of us, suffer from what I'll call just one more thing-itis, okay? You've been staring at the walls all day long. The last 10 minutes of the day, I've got to get a lot of stuff done, and you lose track of time. Um, but nothing to me was more gut-wrenching than showing up and picking up the teary-eyed last kid, okay? I was failing him, and I was very upset with myself for that. And I thought about it. I had to get out of my own way, okay? So I thought about what I could do to match up what I was missing with something that happens that same time of day, whether or not I'm involved with it or not. I take myself out of the equation. And one of the things that I came up with was at the time, I had a uh, young, very strong-willed paralegal that worked for me. And at 5.01 every night, she was on her time. At 4.59, she worked for me, but at 5.01, she was on her time. So I went into the office one day, and I brought her in my room, and I said, okay, look, we got a new rule in the office. You're not allowed to leave unless you take me with you. Okay? Okay? It's that simple. And you have my permission. And every night at you know five to five, she would open my door and say, "Stop your nonsense. Put down the phone. We're getting out of here." And I was never late after that. Okay? And that is really a very rudimentary example of coaching. And it's a funny story, but the bottom line is the value of that is that if I had my wife call me to remind me, it would have been a disaster. Yeah. Because there's a dynamic between husband and wife. There's a dynamic between you and your adolescent that's going to get involved in that situation. This, what I'm referring to here, is a safety valve. It's a pressure valve. Okay? This is something that they can own. And one of the things I came up with when I was running the Edge Foundation was you can't go away to college with them, but we can. And in many ways, this is something that you can do on your own if the school doesn't have a program or whatever. And another benefit to this type of approach is that, among other types of interventions, this is something they can do privately if they want. They don't have to necessarily report anything or go to an office somewhere. They have their one you know, phone session with their coach you know, <laughs> once a week or Skype session or whatever it is. And it's their thing. It's not your thing. Where do you and get them? They the edge can, Edge Foundation? There are, edgefoundation.org is one place. There are a number of places. You can email me and I'll give you some resources about coaching. Uh, but it's something, one of the things I think is, a, is something to potentially explore. Um, other proactive strategies, uh, if they're not taking medication or there is no medication because it's a specific learning disability, um, exercise. There has been a, an enormous amount of research uh, the last couple of years on the link between exercise and brain function. Not just ADHD, various learning disabilities, certainly anxiety, depression, a number of things. Um, there's a very famous book on ADHD called Driven to Distraction. 
which was written by Ned Hallowell and John Rady. John Rady has actually gone in the direction of really exploring um, exercise and its impact on the brain. And he wrote a book a couple of years ago called Spark that talks about a number of different research projects that are wonderful. Uh, every college has, it's free, they can access it, they can go to the gym, they can, uh, one of the things in addition to taking medication that I do religiously to manage my ADHD is I run, okay? Uh, it increases dopamine, it really kind of helps me clear my head. I don't consider it exercise. I really consider it as a form of moving meditation in a way. And that's something they really could look into. Um, developing a plan, the best answer really is a multimodal approach. Medication, accommodations, educational support, the conversations that you have with them, um, coaching potentially as a component, uh, really putting all of these things into perspective. All right. Talking about some uh, proactive strategies. IDEA, use the transition plan to set the stage for college. Involve your child in that as much as you can, okay? Uh, 504 and uh, ADA accommodations, meet with the disability office when you're looking at colleges, go over the 504 plan with them that you currently have and see how that's gonna translate into accommodations when they get to the college. Um, what's available at their school is another issue. Sometimes the biggest problem that you have is there is a disconnect that, you know, in high school, sometimes you're fighting for services. In college, the problem that you will run into or that your children will often run into is that the disability office is happy they came in. We have this, we have that, you'll get extended time. They give them, uh, sometimes it's called a student contract. Sometimes it's just services that they will approve. The problem is, in colleges, sometimes there's a huge disconnect between the disability office and some tenured professor. Yeah. who kind of says, you know, I don't care what your, your disability office says, that's not how I run my classroom. That's a problem, and we have to deal with that. But at least getting them into the office is the first step, and that's crucial. Yes, sir? So I had to deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> I had a senior graduate stage was, I guess, four years ago. And on the disability offices, we went around and interviewed them all. And, uh, you know, we, we had a diligence list of the questions we went through, and I found it very challenging kind of assess the quality of the office. <coughs> and, uh, you know, the one thing I have to my attention to talk to these lectures, is there any kind of independent source that ranks these disability offices that, because it's hard to go in and interview. I, I, would, I would say, I would think the problem is somewhat different. I mean, the question was, is there a, an independent source that um, kind of ranks the disability offices. There are a number of publications that talk about, you know, friendly schools and so on. But personnel changes happen. And typically, that's not the whole equation, is that you go in and you see the disability office, and they're friendly and welcoming and open, but you don't know what kind of faculty they're going to be interacting with, and that's another problem issue. Uh, but those, that may be another list of questions that you ask. How does the faculty, are they receptive? to the services or accommodations that you offer or approve. And you know, to what extent you have issues with that, those are questions that you may want to ask because that's a very real uh, yeah. obstacle that you may run into. But I just want to kind of finish up so I can give people some general question time. Uh, oh, okay, um, high stakes testing accommodations for the SAT and the uh, ACT. Um, there's been a problem over the last couple of years where the, um, there's been some bad press that the um, students who maybe didn't have disabilities because of the high competition for slots at colleges were requesting extended time. My experience has been this is supposedly getting better, but that they are getting much more selective, and most of these are one on appeal. Uh, parents will come to me, you know, we went in with what he gets at school, they didn't allow it, what do we do now? I think the, uh, the college board is in a position where, in order to kind of combat this potential bad press, they're making parents come in with a second set of more specific requests, why they're necessary. We do a lot of these. Much more of these cases are won on appeal. I can tell you that the good thing is that um, the mindset that you want to have is we're not asking for a benefit. We're really talking about leveling the playing field. That's really the mindset you want. Okay, um, 
in terms of uh, testing accommodations, update your evaluations. We talked about that. Understand and articulate specific deficits. Get help from the school they're in now. Get the guidance counselor to write that letter, why they're getting, what they're getting, why it's necessary. And again, you know, we're not asking you for services. We're help asking you to help us get them somewhere else. That's really your mindset. Don't give up if you're rejected. A lot of these are one on appeal. How okay? Uh, I would say you, when you start talking, taking the PSAT and that type of thing, I would definitely start getting all of Okay. Um, practical pitfalls, students are reluctant to seek help. Uh, advocacy has two sides, too. This is important. It's not just about getting the services, it's the follow through. Is the professor giving them what they're supposed to be getting from the disability office, like we asked for uh, earlier, or in high school? Or is the school providing what you fought so hard for? Or does that have to be changed? Even if you got what you asked for, their needs may change as they get older. That's important. OK, summing up. Students with ADHD and LD have a high potential, but they're at high risk. Transition to college uh, needs to be addressed proactively. If it is, they can not just survive in college, they can thrive there. Okay. Being proactive and addressing these transitions can turn that high risk into high potential. Okay. Now, questions? <laughs> yes? Uh, what if you go to a school and they're non cooperative? Then do we have to hire you to come and. You could do it? that. I'm available. <laughs> uh, but I would say, you know, if you're looking at colleges, you've got to avoid the colleges that you don't think are going to be cooperative. That's really the I already reason got that I need to tell my daughter that we have to check the disability office. So okay. That'll work. Yeah. Okay. okay. Just when they sign the waiver, does that give you a right to really be involved in the, um, the center there? And it, the gets, the, it allows them to, the school to talk to you when you call. If they sign the waiver, um, it allows you to um, advocate to go advocate to the disability with office with them. Okay, I would say with, with, as yeah, opposed yeah, to yeah, with, okay. with. Anyone? Yes. Um, I have a friend who has a child with um, dyslexia, but he's been going to private schools, special education schools. And so her question is, um, does she need to go through the process in the public school district in order to aid getting what he needs in college, or is information from the private school enough? The information from the private school could certainly be enough. Okay. And what I would do is take that information to the colleges that she's looking at to kind of see what, you know, what their position is going to be. Uh, that can be very helpful. Okay? But it's not necessary uh, to go to the, the public school. Yeah? I know this is primarily about kids who have ADD, but the kids who don't that also might need some support, you basically recommend the same sort of conversation, the open, and uh, Absolutely. But we're in college, I know they have like tutoring, and I know they have writing centers and whatnot, but is there coaching available in some way for that situation? Some think schools have coaching programs for freshmen. So it's all kids that come in to kind of get them into part of that orientation process of first year. I think more schools should have that. Um, but it certainly is an option you can look into on your own for a number of reasons. It doesn't mean necessarily they have a learning disability or ADHD or anything. It could be that they're just not ready for this or you're concerned that they're not going to be doing this stuff on their own. They need a guide and you want to do that. 